This is the Annex, a sociology podcast. I'm Joseph Cohen from Queens College in the City University of New York. I'm joined with my colleague, Daniel Morrison from Abilene Christian University. Uh, Dan, good to see you. Good to see you, Joe. Always happy to be here. And today we got a, a return guest uh, a, and a terrific guest, Daniel Lorison from Swarthmore University uh, to discuss his research on the inner world and social consequences of political professionals. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be back. So Daniel's book called Producing Politics Inside the Exclusive Campaign World, where the privileged few shape politics for all of us. I'm really stoked to uh, talk about it today. But uh, before we begin, I've been, uh, we've been having an argument and I want to, uh, an argument, a, a, a disagreement among ourselves, uh, me and some colleagues. And I wanted to catch your uh, opinion on it. Here's the situation and tell me if this is something you're experiencing in your department. A lot of people are wrestling with questions about the role of uh, online in their department's uh, future. Like there's a lot of students who want to learn online. There's a lot of faculty who want to teach online. And uh, our department and a lot of departments uh, are faced with sort of these twin demands and, and are asking themselves, okay, what's the role of uh, online teaching in our department's future? My personal opinion is online is a patently inferior method of teaching people. It is, uh, it just, I don't think it can be done well. And it's my desire, like in, in, in the departments that I, I participate in to just limit it. But I wanted to get your takes. Are you facing this pressure for uh, to teach online? Do you teach online? How do you feel about it? Daniel, let's start off as our guest. Are you teaching online? How are you feeling about online? I, you know, I hated it the semester that I did it. Well, I should say it was better than I thought it would be. It was, I felt like there were some real conversations that happened. It worked, it worked better than I thought it would. So I was dreading it. I didn't like it. It didn't feel good in my body also to just be like sitting at the computer for that, you know, for that long, that intensely. Um, but, but, you know, I, I sort of came away from that experience, not wanting to do it again, but thinking like, that was a lot better than nothing. It was a lot better than it could be. Yeah. Um, our department is not, a, you know, our college has been pretty clear that we are in-person small liberal arts community and if anything some of the pushback has been from faculty who didn't feel safe coming back to the classroom and didn't feel like the college was having enough sort of you know pandemic uh safety features in in place for as long as they ought to right. um so there hasn't been so much debate but there's I've definitely noticed um, I haven't been teaching the last year but I've been running my research lab um, and last semester, especially, I had a Zoom component mostly for community-based researchers who were off campus and weren't going to make a 45-minute commute just to come sit with me us for an hour. Um, a lot of students would come to that, and it seemed like more than was reasonable given how likely it was that anyone was sick in any given day, you know, on any yeah. given day. And I, I sort of cracked down is pretty too, probably too strong but I was like you should be here in person unless you physically are unable to be here in person because I just don't the hybrid I think is the worst of all possible worlds mm -hmm. like you can't you know the people who are on zoom can't really fully participate they kind of distract everybody else um and the you know and managing the discussion across the two media mediums media is just really challenging um so I really don't like that um so that's sort of where I am. I think it's a it's a fine substitute occasionally, but it's not it's not as good as being real in person. But Swarthmore is like definitely you're coming back. We're an in person college, and you it sounds like you agree with that. I mean, I don't think you know. I think I, what do I think? Um, uh, I have a lot of sympathy for the people who are concerned around the the pandemic measures, but I think that broadly in person works better and you know we are able you know, we're a really rich really small school so like nobody can't get to class because of child care issues right. or accessibility issues or etc like we definitely have you know first gen and working class students who might need to manage things at home sometimes but but you know mostly people are really well supported and so i think the you know it makes sense for the kind of campus that we are at. Dan Morrison, how about you? What's going on at Abilene Christian University and, and with you specifically with the online? 
Well, I would say ACU is similar to Swarthmore in some respects, perhaps definitely not as wealthy, but certainly small liberal arts college uh, committed to the in-person experience for the undergraduates who are on the Abilene campus. The thing that just differentiates ACU from Swarthmore and, and maybe makes it similar to some other schools is that we have uh, essentially a branch campus operated out of Dallas. And that's those programs are almost completely online. Almost all of the programs are pretty much completely online. There's an office building that people need to come in and have an exam proctor or something like that. But um, it's a small kind of central administration up in Richardson, Texas. And so those programs have primarily been at the master's level and the EDD level, but increasingly ACU has decided to move into the undergraduate uh, online market, mm. so to speak. And right. so uh, I think, you know, the concern that some people have raised is just that, is this a two-tiered kind of educational experience where, you know, you have the more maybe privileged, maybe the, the higher status, higher class, more likely to be uh, second generation or continuing generation students, whiter students, more affluent students, right, who uh, have the time and space and resources and supports to come to Abilene, which is a relatively small, you know, city in West Texas, versus those who um, have have a variety of challenges and are from um, just have a variety of disadvantages, right? And so maybe they opt for an ACU online degree because there is some status with a private liberal arts university. Mm. Um, but also those classes are not the same as, uh, not the same in terms of format or structure. And, you know, you can ask questions about how uniform the quality is across those, those modalities. I'm not here to make a claim about the quality of those, yeah. of those educational experiences. Uh, I did teach a class for ACO online. It was mostly, um, master's students in healthcare administration. I personally found it more difficult to kind of keep up with in the flow of my current work, you know, teaching in-person classes and teaching an online class. It was mostly async, well, it was entirely asynchronous. Um, that was a challenge. Um, and I've opted not to do it again. Right. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. That's it. I guess that, so it, 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 I'm getting the sense that whether or not online is good for you is really partly a function of who you serve and what like your organization is doing. Cause like, I mean, my, our, our organization, our, our mandate is to create like a quality $8,000 a year degree program for like the working class of Queens and Nassau County. And so for us, there's a discussion. Well, online will expand franchise and it will allow more people to get degrees. And there's that angle. But my impression from COVID is that online is patently worse. And my concern is that if we lean in on online, then the working class won't have the access to that campus experience that your students get at private schools. You know what's interesting, and, and correct me if you have a different impression. You know what the big difference was? I learned this in COVID in our graduate program. During COVID, I realized that only a fraction of what students learn in college is professor to student communicated knowledge in a class setting. Mm -hmm. Like when they were online, they weren't doing projects, they weren't meeting each other, they weren't like collaborating with stuff, no extracurriculars. And like, it turns out that's a super important part of like the formative experience. And you could see it when the students went to the job market, you know. Well, I think that's right, Joe. I often think about our campus as being like a tiny city. Yeah. You know, people sleep on campus. They eat on campus. They do recreation on campus. They do all the things that, you know, non-student citizens in Abilene and Taylor County do, but they just do it in much uh, more intensive social networked relations, right? And those relationships are ways that we ask students to practice what it means to be a, a citizen, right? So there's actually like a demo, I mean, not to get all dewy on us, but there's like a democratic function of college, a residential college experience that um, seems significant, not only just for, you know, job skills and networking and how to talk with people and work across differences and things like that, but, but also like, what does it mean to be a member of a community? And what are the trade-offs? that you have to live with or accommodate in order to 
um, you know, uh, be with others. Daniel? I think that I think that's that's part of what you're missing. But even just for sort of the, you know, even if just what you're paying attention to, because if you're a commuter college, your students aren't getting a lot of that regardless. But even just for the in-classroom piece, like a lot of my students, the first class I taught when we came back in person, basically said they didn't remember anything from their classes from the previous year that had been all online. Yeah. Um, that they mm -hmm. didn't feel like they learned really very much or retained very much. And that might have been partly, you know, stress and newness and all of that. But I think part of it was just the sort of format of just being only in a computer screen with other people. And even if, you you know, I did like breakout rooms so they could talk in small groups and we had projects that they worked on um, and came back and talked to the group about and we had a Slack channel for for back and forth. You know, we I, I did all the yeah, things the works. that he had, had recommended. Um, not all the things, obviously, but, you know, a whole bunch of things, but I still feel like, you know, yeah, it's just you, some of teaching is, is relational work, right, is about yeah, yeah. being in a, a, a kind of, you know, teacher-student relationship with your students, and that just doesn't feel as, as complete for most of us online. I think there are people you know, I see sort of uh, folks on Twitter or whatever saying, you know, like online is just as real or you can't have real relationships. And, I, you know, I, up to a point. Um, and I think people do forge meaningful connections through primarily online interactions. But I think for, you know, for the work of teaching, especially if it's just, you know, it's going to be 14, 15 weeks at most. Mm. I just feel like I can't like I, I struggled. I saw an email from a student from when, when I was teaching online and I like struggled to even remember what she looked like or what she'd yeah. done in the class or whatever. Whereas, you know, a student from a, only a year and a half ago who was in a class with me in person, I would absolutely have a much better sense of. So I just think that's really, it, it's, I, I think your, your fundamental argument is right, Joe. It's just, it's just not as good. It can be better in a few small ways it could be you know <laughs> yeah. It, yeah also like so i'm in, in my department i was i've kind of been a media guy it's one of just my areas and and so i've been i've been observing online really before covid too and really i have never i've seen good classes for online but i have never observed an online class that i would send my own kid to that goes right up to the mit MOOCs like mm -hmm. if you want to just pour millions of dollars into infrastructure or whatever, even those were like, you know, it's, it's just not the same. And I think you're right about that, Daniel. It's like, it's the relationship aspect. It's like, yeah, you become a different, an extra adult in that students are not adult because some of them are your age, but like a mentor yeah. in their sort of personal journey. If you have, uh, for those of you who are uh, watching online or after the fact, if you want to, Put your argument in as to why I'm completely out of lunch. Uh, to lunch, you can do that in the uh, in the chat window, or uh, just uh, take a clip and criticize it on social media. We see it all. Anyhow, let's turn to Daniel's book now. Producing politics inside the exclusive campaign world, where the privileged few shape politics for all of us. In any case, it got a, a ton of uh, press and it asked some really, really important questions about the hidden side of politics. Well, the, the aspect of politics that we don't see, we're probably not even aware of, but it can be very important. So can you start us off maybe by explaining to us why do political campaigns matter? Like, what's the relevance of them? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the sort of obvious answer, and it's part of why I care, absolutely, is that they, they may play some role in determining who actually gets elected, right, and who wields the power that you get when you're elected to, especially the focus of the book is really national politics. So, you know, who, which party controls the Senate and the House, which party holds the presidency, um, and, and all and all the way down to all the state offices and local offices as well, you know, has huge impacts on our lives, right? Like from everything from, you know, how many potholes there are on my streets in West Philadelphia, which is a lot, um, to the funding for the schools, to, you know, to, you know, laws about inclusion for trans people, which obviously affect me directly, all of these things, right, come down to who holds office. So that's, you know, that's obvious, hopefully, to most people listening, but I think worth saying, right, that um, that even, you know, I have a inter, inter, 
how do you say that word interlocutor that's one of those words i've never yeah. said out loud yeah i know yeah. i think it's I interlocutor. Yeah, interlocutor yeah right thanks there's a person in my head who's like politics don't matter because it's all just the capitalists whatever yeah. um and i think you know I, I disagree with that right i think that there's lots of ways that that differences between democrats and republicans in the u.s matter for people's quality of life um in in really important ways um but mostly that's that's obvious. Um, one of the things I argue in the book actually is that it's it's not actually clear how much campaigns matter to who ends up winning. Um, it's not clear to political science research. It's not clear to many of the people who are doing this work. Um, and it's just incredibly hard to, to measure effectively. We can talk about that more if you want. Um, but I think there's a less obvious way that campaigns matter that I think that is why I was really interested in this. And that's because they are if not the way, at least one of the big ways that the world of politics, of political power, of state power seeks to be in communication with regular people, right? Offers a connection to, you know, you know everybody else who's not in that world um, for their job or through their connections. Um, you know, the campaigns could, and to some extent do, uh, function as a way to, you know, let people know what's happening in politics, what are the key issues, and to tell people um, your voice matters, your vote matters, your, you know, we want you involved in this. Um, and so, so there's that, that sort of connective piece, and I think there's also sort of the the cultural piece, for lack of a better word, which is campaigns are where huge amounts of communication come from, right? Um, ads, speeches, flyers, mailers, you know, it's every ad you see in November's in Pennsylvania um, on any channel you might watch. Um, and that's, I think, also not just where people either are invited in or not, but where they get their idea about what politics is about. Um, and there's, you know, and, and what politics is about, is it about, you know, is it about fighting? Is it about, is it about justice? What is it about? And that, um, I think is also another reason to pay attention to campaigns. And so I feel like when we, this is my understanding, when, when we conventionally think of political campaigns, we might think of them as sports teams, and we might think that what really matters is which side won in the contest. Mm -hmm. And I gather from your work that you're saying, no, no, there is a, there's like a hidden side where the, where both sides are are similar in some ways. Like the the left and the right in the world of campaigning are a lot more similar than you might suspect. And the differences between those campaigns and like campaigners and the world of professional campaigning and society at large that also has a political influence. Did I am I getting that uh, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think the. Um... You know, I would. I just said I think the the policies, the way they govern, are different in important ways. Um, but the the people doing the work are pretty similar to each other. You know, I I kept looking through my interviews for you know sort of expecting to see the Democrats are like this and the Republicans are like this. So there are there are some differences. Um, Republicans have a better sort of. Uh, channel for bringing new people in and helping them rise up through the ranks that's a little bit more organized and connected to college campuses. Um, they tend to be, you know, there's some differences in the um, the the ways the networks work and that sort of thing, but fundamentally they all roughly see politics in similar ways, right? They all are deeply, deeply committed to their side and they really are there not just because they like the competition or just or just because they're making a ton of money, although those both of those things are often true, um, especially at the top of the sort of political staff, political consultant hierarchy. Um, but they also are there because they believe that their party is better for the country. Um, so that's you know, that's one piece of it. But the other piece, which I think maybe you're getting at, is that they're also really demographically similar. Um, yeah. So I have a, a chart I use in, in you know, statistics I share in the book and a chart I use in talks um, showing that about, you know, 4% of people in the U.S. went to the top uh, most exclusive colleges and universities in the country. 4% of people who went to college. Um, so it's actually even even smaller yeah. percentage of people overall. Um, and something like 40% of Democratic campaign op operatives went to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, also, you know, Swarthmore, not very many, but, um, you know, 
incredibly exclusive, elite, highly rejected colleges and universities. Um, it's about 25% for Republican campaign operatives. So they're a little, you know, from a somewhat broader swath of the U.S., but not that much broader. Yeah. Do you think that it it makes a big difference? Do you think that there is the fact that they draw from so heavily from elite circles, do you think that creates like just a fundamental disconnect between the people who are running political campaigns and like the regular Joe on the street? I think so. I mean, you know, the short answer is yes. The The slightly longer answer is, I, of course, I don't think it's impossible for somebody with a elite pedigree or however you want to, that's sort of a terrible phrase, but you know, <laughs> who's, who, who's come from these circles to be effective at connecting with people across the, that kind of class and, and social difference. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I really emphasize in the book is that the, um, a lot of what can, the decisions that campaigns make, like they'll tell you, you know, we have these sophisticated data analytics and we have these models and we, you know, we use polling and we use, you know, you hear about Cambridge Analytica and you hear about all these sort of like sophisticated micro data, whatever, um, big, big data micro targeting, sorry. But, you know, and that, like, that's all true. They use that, but that can't tell you like whether Hillary Clinton should have gone with I'm with her as a campaign slogan. Right. Um, that can't tell you, um, you know, even if it's all working perfectly, it can't tell you sort of the big themes that you should use. And it can't tell you sort of, you know, it can't it can't make every decision. Right. Um, and then it often doesn't work perfectly. Um, in fact, it works really, really poorly. That was one of the issues uh, in 2016. So a lot of what campaigns have to do is based on campaign professionals sort of gut instinct about what's going to be effective. And that gut instinct, I think all gut instinct comes from sort of two places, right? It comes from your work experiences. It comes from, and in this case, most cam campaign professionals have been working in politics since they were 16 or 18 or 22. Um, and it comes from your sort of social class location, your, your social milieu more broadly, and though both of those things are for campaign professionals really, 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 really different than um, most of the rest of us, even sociologists, let alone you know truck drivers or yeah. uh, you know waiters and waitresses or any other you know <laughs> regular person out there. Danny, want to ask a question? Or? Yeah, I, I'm really curious, Daniel, about how these professionals then. Um, account for or assess their own failures especially yeah. so you've got people who have been doing this for a long time you know they go with their gut or they go with polling or whatever what happens when that goes wrong like how how do people stay in this game let's say they they have a, a few failures in a row like what what's what work do they do to kind of make that acceptable yeah i mean there's two there's two pieces to that right one is what are the, what story do they tell themselves and the other is sort of what story do they tell the world to get an, I mean, in part, so, so for the, for themselves, the, the thing that they, many, many, many of them said to me, and this was one of the things that was surprising to me is that is basically like, you know, we can make a difference around the margins. Um, if the environment is such that it's going to be a democratic year and I'm a Republican, there's only so much I can do. Um, and so, you know, one of the first people I interviewed actually was a, a Republican data, like uh, micro-targeting data guy. Mm -hmm. And he basically said he, he'd just come from giving a talk where he had slides showing all the predictive models about how, you know, and this was in 2010. So how, how, how sure it was that 2008 was going to be a democratic year. Um, and there are, there's, you know, there's a issue of a political science journal published every other year with, you know, 10 or 12 articles with different models predicting the outcome of the election, three or six or nine months in advance, and they, more of them tend to be right than wrong. Um, you know, they're not all right all the time. Um, so I think that's a big, that's a big part of it for them is they, they know that they're, you know, that a lot of what seems to matter for whether which party wins at the national level is, you know, which party was in power last and how's the economy. Um, so that's a big part of it. Uh, can you sort of just give us like paint us a picture of what these campaigns look like from the inside? Like when you get there, like, what do you see? Like, what, what's it like? 
Yeah, so I mean, you know, the the book is based entirely on on interviewing people, but I worked on the Obama campaign in 2008 um, as a at the the very bottom of the you are officially on staff hierarchy. Um, but I got a sense of it, and this is also what I heard from talking to people, which is there. I think the closest analog that many people might have experienced is like being in a in a play, in the set that sense of like you're all on a team and as the production approaches, which is in this case, the um, the election day, everybody is working around the clock and there's just not enough time. And you're all, I mean, the, the weekend before the 2008 election, I think I was out of my house the entire weekend. I think we slept like two hours a night. We lived on pizza and I don't really drink whiskey, but there was a lot of whiskey, um, right? <laughs> um, and it's just that, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I. People said it's like being in a foxhole with somebody. It's like being at war. They talked a lot about war and sports, um, neither of which I have any direct experience with. But, um, <laughs> but it, you know, it, it's it's intense and it's um, it's it's kind of addictive. I mean, I, you know, I I got back from that campaign and my partner was like, "You are never doing that again." Um, <laughs> and in fact, I can't quite believe you did that just now. And you know, uh, wait, was it because you were gone or because you became intense? I was gone. And even when I was home, I mean, I was, you know, so I was the assistant regional field director for Northern California or something. Right. Oh, so okay. like, All right. Obama is probably going to win. He's certainly going to win California. Like, how can you how can they need you this much? Right. That you need to be in the in the campaign office uh -huh. all day, every day. And then I would be like up at two o'clock in the morning sending you know we a lot of what my work was was like sending lists of voters for people to contact um and my partner was like what like how but then you know however many years later 16 i can't do math right now but um arithmetic live is just something i'm really bad at. <laughs> um, we will hold you to it 12 years later in 2020 um she was helping run a national or a statewide political organization and you know couldn't ever stop doing um doing things so she was at a higher level than I was but that culture also of just like you must work all the time um really got you know it it, it it's hard to avoid and it's part of this is the other thing I another thing I talk about in the book is that um you know, it's part of also since they can't, since political professionals can't really make judgments about each other's skill based on purely objective criteria. Mm -hmm. One of the big sort of proxies that I think they use is, are you working 18 hours a day? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And if you're working 18 hours a day and you always respond to an email right away or a text or whatever it is, then you're a good campaigner and you'll get moved up through the ranks and sort of get to get to be one of the the higher ups and if you prioritize balance or having a life or sleep um yeah. then you're not a good campaigner it's like performative commitment to the cause type of thing is that what that is i i mean i don't think they feel like it's performative yeah. um but i think there's got to be a way you know and, and, and you know when you're in it you're sympathetic to it like whether or not you know, whether or not Obama won the presidency in 2008 was going to have huge knock-on effects and we had to be really sure and we couldn't be, you know, the polls looked good, but polls looked good for Clinton eight years later. So right. you, know, you just, you want to put, you know, leave everything on the field is the the sports expression, right? Yeah. Um, you just want to do everything you possibly can and you can't know what that is. So I don't think it's, you know, I, I'm, very sympathetic to it and i also think it's deeply unhealthy it's a, like it's not a sustainable way to live it pushes out people who want to have lives who want to have children who um need you know need more than three or four hours of sleep at a night um so i think there's there's got to be a better way to do it while i also have a lot of sympathy for why it is that way do you, do you think that the fact that those type of people thrive do you think that ultimately affects policy and law possibly yeah i mean i think the one of the one of the sort of distinction i was expecting um you know differences between republicans and democrats i was expecting differences and there are some differences by sort of the part of campaigns that people work in um but one person uh, actually a couple people said to me basically the the real distinction in politics is between the campaign side and the policy side um, the people who who thrive in campaigns and the sort of policy wonks who are bad for campaigns was what they said. Um, yeah. 
so I'm not sure how much this culture um, is shaping the sort of policy offices of politicians, but it is shaping, you know, many, 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 I have this data set where I look at the careers of people who've ever worked in a presidential campaign, and a lot of them end up as the chief of staff or the communications director or et cetera for a senator or in the White House or et cetera. So they are shaping the choices that election elected officials make. Um, they are, and they're the you know they're the intermediaries between elected officials as well as uh, candidates and and the public. So I think it does it does it does matter, um, even if there's also some other people in those offices who are um, who are you know <laughs> coming at it from a different maybe from a slightly different angle. Dan, do you have to go? I do. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. I have to run and uh, teach class. But Daniel, thanks so much for being on and look sure. forward to seeing our uh, audience again soon. All right. We'll see you next time, Dan. Take it easy. Thanks for thanks for stopping by. Let me ask you, let me ask you this, Daniel. Was there anything about that world that you found distasteful or you thought was sort of dysfunctional or had negative, you know, aspects for society's larger well-being in, in the world of these po political campaigns? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, one of the uh, one thing was just the way that a lot of them talked about regular people and voters. I mean, they were, you know, on the one hand, you know, they said, you know, people aren't that interested in politics. And that's true. Like a lot of people are not paying that much attention. Um, but they genuinely generally thought it was because people were like just sort of obsessed with trivial things like they care more about their mall visits or their shoes or their crappy television than they do about politics. I don't think that's the main reason. Um, they also, you know, a couple people, this actually was, I heard this much, this sort of thing much more from Republicans and not from all of them, but from a few of them than I did from Democrats. But I definitely heard from some people who were like, if you don't care enough to vote, then your voice shouldn't ma matter. You know, there's something really, you know, this sort of, not just disdain, but, but at least from a couple of people I talked to real um, sort of antipathy for the for people who were not paying attention to politics and no, no sense that that might be something that they could do anything about or or had any role in so that was that was certainly one part of it um i'll also you know there, there were also i mean the uh i went to some of the the very fanciest offices and houses i've ever been to yeah. um, as part of this research so you know there. I'm not convinced that uh, campaign finance is the solution to most of the problems, or certainly that it's, I don't think it's either necessary or sufficient to solve many of the problems of American politics. I'm not opposed to it, but I don't think it's the main issue. Um, but seeing how much money the the very top people were were channeling. You've jumped into the world of political campaigns and, and, and witnessed like a whole dimension of politics that frankly, I didn't really think much about. You think of the politicians, you think about the policies and the voters, but you don't think about who's scurrying in the middle there, you know, interfacing with media and things like that and voters. Now that you've seen that world, uh, what has shifted in your, in the way you look at politics and the way you look at government? Like when you take just the sum total of all that you've seen, what, what, how, have you, how, are you, uh, how are you thinking differently than you did before you dove into that world, even before you dove into the Obama campaign? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. It's a sort of hard question to answer because it's been so long at this point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this, this project started as my dissertation and I was thinking about it even earlier in grad school. And then there was a long hiatus and you know process of various articles getting rejected and so on before right. there, was, there was this book. Um, but I think, you know, one thing is, I think before I started this work, I would have had the much more, you know, there's this book that came out that was probably part of why I wanted to do this work that was um, by Marcos Mulitsis, who's the, um, who founded Daily Coast, which is this like online um, political site in sort of the early days of online political anything. Um, and there, it's called, I think, Crashing the Gate. And their whole thing is like the, the, Democrats are doing the wrong thing because their consultants are just in it to make money and they're just sort of bad guys who are mercenaries. There's, you know, there's more to it than that, but that's the gist of the art argument. And I think I, I would have, I probably expected something similar that there was, um, 
you know, that I wouldn't like the people that I, that I met, um, that they were, that they were just cynical or whatever. And I, so I was, I was really as surprised as maybe too strong, but I wasn't expecting um, people who cared as much about the issues as I think most people I talked with did, you know, I, uh, somewhere in the book, I have a quote from a Republican um, pollster who basically, you know, I asked if at the end of the interview, is there anything you want else you want me to know? And he was like, yes, tell people the difference between Republican and, and, and Democratic poll- uh, campaign professionals is not, you know, it is what we believe in. Like I do this because he said, you know, not getting the quote exactly right, but he was like, I may, it makes a whale of a difference who's president. Um, you know, I don't give a damn whether the toothpaste box is green or red, but it makes so, and if I wanted to make more money, I would go into commercial marketing research yeah. instead of political polling. And I believe him, a couple of people said that, but like, I don't care if the toothpaste paste is green, you know, whatever is green or red, I care if it's Mitt Romney or, you know, John Kerry or, you know, yeah. those guys were running against each other. We get the idea. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, it made me, I really actually, you know, liked a lot of the people that I talked with. I think partly they just have a lot of social skills. Although I said that to one person and they were like, we don't have social skills. I was like, well, I'm a sociologist. You guys have more social skills than we do. Um, <laughs> But, you know, but they, I really like, like, they are smart, they care, they want the policies that they care about to, to, you know, they, they, so far as I could tell, unless they were all really good bullshitters, mm. they, you know, they think that this will be better for people, whichever side they're on. Um, yeah. So that was sort of a surprise to me. Also, I was really prepared to think the Republicans were all awful people. And I think they're, Policies, especially especially recently, are really awful. But the the individuals, I think, believe in what they're doing. Yeah, no, they believe they believe uh, they have an earnest agenda somewhere in there, like all of us for their political yeah. support. You know what's interesting about that? I, I've experienced something very similar early in my career. I would have been very quick to reduce human action to the quest for money or power or status or things like that. And as I observe more of the world, I find that people just sort of have a commitment to a thing that's almost inexplicable. Mary Beth Stolp is somebody who's really, she's a sociologist of hobbies, I think at uh, Northern Iowa. And it was like, you know, like I find when I started studying podcasters, I figured they were in it for fame or money or attention or something. And I just met people who like deeply cared about knitting. They just right. super cared about anime. And you're like, wow, like people will just, like people really do care about things like a lot more than our theory assumes. And I, I'm catching that same, you know, impression coming from you in yeah. politics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Very, very, very interesting. What about methodologically? You, you've spoken to a lot of people. You got directly involved in sort of what you were studying. Methodologically, did this, did you, do you think you grew uh, as an observer? Were there any interesting lessons that you got in the field or through your interviews, tricks of the trade, things like that, that maybe matured in this foray into the world of politics? Um, you know, I think if anything, one thing I learned from this project is that uh, grad students should not try to do a three method uh, dissertation because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I did did uh, I think by the time I was not all of them while I was in grad school, but I did uh, eighty four interviews. I put together this data set in Excel with five thousand individual people and their you know twenty rows for each person with their you know, what they were doing in each of the election cycles from 1980 to 2020, um, you know, and and I did this sort of, I mean, it sort of started out intending to be participant observation or ethnography, and at the end, I was just like, I can't take notes, I'm just doing this, and I'll remember what I remember. <laughs> um, so, you know, so part of my lesson is just like, that was too much. Somebody I, you know, I, I don't think I would have let any of my advisors stop me, so I can't blame them. But, but <laughs> somebody should have stopped me. Um, so that's my one, my one takeaway. And I think, you know, I, I got really good at, at, you know, all all the things necessary to put together a data set like the one I've got and managing the undergrad research assistants who were helping me. And I've carried that through. Um, the, the interviews, I don't know. I don't think I'm the world's best interviewer. I always listen to my interviews and I'm like, there's, there's so many things I could have asked further. Or I let that person get away with saying that without, you know, 
cross-referencing or et cetera, but you know. You're never gonna get rid of that. No. that Monday morning quarterbacking, forget about it. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like it's like criticizing your own paper. Like you're always gonna come down hard on it when you read Fair it. Fair enough. Can't get you. <laughs> so my understanding of your work is that you sort of work at the intersection of politics stratification of culture you think that's a fair characterization of sort of where you're operating i think it does i mean we were we were talking before we started the official show and uh, yeah. you know the the culture piece is a little funny because i'm really bad at it, culture basically all aspects of culture that aren't mm. parenting or academia or like queer culture from my 20s uh and maybe a few other things um but the i think what culture so what cultural sociology kind of means at least as it applies to me is taking meanings taking sort of the sense that people make of things seriously as a as sometimes a cause a mechanism of you know an important feature of the way the social world works um or sometimes it just means like you know reading a lot of audio and and talking about that so i think yeah. both of those in that sense i'm a cultural sociologist i'm not a sociologist of culture right um, well, you're a mega cultural mechanism guy in this one and in your previous book, I remember thinking, oh, because that's what I liked about it. It spelled out a cultural mechanism yeah. uh, of stratification. So, I I mean, I think you might be selling yourself short. I actually find you to be quite a good culture culture guy, in my opinion. But, you know, I guess uh, self-definitions are always elusive. Let, let me ask you this. What work in your space excites you like where do you like who can you think of uh other people who are doing stuff or other areas of research in your space that you you think are exciting and and you'd like to sort of direct people's attention towards yeah this this is a question i should have made a list for before we started <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're gonna get in so trouble gonna forget yeah. the names but i think there's a so i'm gonna maybe do this without saying any names but there's a there's a set of work that i think is really good um which is which is doing this thing of looking at the people who are the sort of intermediaries between regular people in power in various ways yeah. um and that you know there's work on there's work on wealth managers there's or people who run family offices there's work on um you know people in uh you know in, in administrative roles or bureaucratic roles of the state um but all of the people who are not you know, the elites themselves, but who are the managers, the facilitators, the supporters, and the intermediaries for elites, I think is really important and worth doing. I think, you know, understanding elites is also important, but that, you know, there's a, you can't often get Bill Gates himself to talk to you, um, or even people whose names you don't know, but are equally unbelievably wealthy. But you can get the people who run their offices, who manage their foundations, who, you know, et cetera, et cetera, to talk to you. You know, I don't think Barack Obama is ever going to sit down and talk with me, although, you know, if he wanted to, that'd be great. Um, but I've talked to a lot of the people who, you know, I haven't talked to his two head campaign managers, but I've talked to a lot of the people who like helped get him into office or similarly Hillary Clinton and so on. So I think that the sort of the attention to the worlds in which eliteness is produced and supported or power is is produced and supported is is really important work and there's a lot i think there's a lot more to be done there yeah i find it actually more interesting i'm i'm less interested in what the figureheads have to say about like the figureheads of social movements because i often feel like they're you know it's it's just it's idiosyncratic and it won't might not they might not know be able to tap into like whatever social processes are like working under them mm -hmm. you know yeah so i i mean i i'd, I'd say like i i it'd be awesome to talk to celebrities though but i i i i you know i i see the value of uh of what with the space that you're operating in. i have a let me let me rephrase my question mm -hmm. so like a young sociologist an early career sociologist who is um wants to do a type of sociology that's going to be relevant in the world of politics they want to engage these campaigns they want to engage political space what should they do how should they uh how should they proceed before before you answer i just want to say uh we are watching the chat window so if you have questions while daniel's giving the answer please put them in the chat window and we'll we'll pass them along so go ahead daniel uh, uh what's your view um you know, my first answer is probably a really cynical one, which is, you know, I, I this book did get some traction and it, there are some some organizations and some people who sort of took it up and are are trying to make 
the world of campaigns and the world of politics more inclusive. But you know, the 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 hopes that I had for how much change you might see, <laughs> you know, no book ever does any everything you want it to. So so fine. I knew they were sort of dreams in a way, but the hopes that I had for what might happen and you know, actual visible engagement with the the world of campaigns so far, there's a pretty big gap between those two things. Um, so I'm not sure, I you know, I, I actually think if you're a young person interested in making a difference in the world of politics, you should go into the world of politics uh, yeah. um, and not study the world of politics. Um, that said, and I think if you are going to study the world of politics, the kind of stuff that gets more traction is probably the stuff that's more like what they're doing already, which is, you know, experiments on, you know, there's these two political science scientists um, that both actually went to Berkeley around the time I did, uh, Kala and Brockman. Josh Kella and David Brockman are possibly, I've got the first and last names mixed up. Um, but they, you know, they do all these experiments showing that how effective deep canvassing is at changing people's mind or that sort of thing. And that's the kind of stuff that a campaign can take and, and go, oh, we should be doing more of this. Let's go do this. So I think if that's, you know, if you have an idea about what might be more effective, I think that kind of thing could work. Um, hmm. I think if you're, you know, I think the reason to be a sociologist uh, is mostly because you want to study the stuff and understand it and think about it and talk about it. And if you're lucky, that has some effect in the real world outside of sociology, um, but not, but it's, it's an indirect route to that yeah. kind of, that kind of influence. Yeah. The, the prize is the research, the act of talking to people itself, I think. It's, it's funny how you mentioned it's, it's really true when you are about to write something or publish something that you really put a lot of, you imagine it a lot. Like you remember in Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, how they like wrote a song that aligned the planets and brought world peace or something like that. <laughs> you want to, you want to believe it's that, but like the best case scenario, my experience is like, you know, a couple press pickups and about a birthday worth of Facebook likes <laughs> and, <laughs> and then a positive job review or something like that. It seems to be like, what do you really get? Daniel Lorison from Swarthmore University. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was fun as always. You've been listening to the Annex, a sociology podcast. Uh, catch us on the web at theannexpodcast.com. The Annex is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more information, visit queenspodcastlab.org. On behalf of my guest, Daniel Lorison, I'm Joe Cohen. Thanks for listening.